All right, today then we want to continue our discussion of textual criticism, specifically as it relates uh, to the New Testament. Uh, yesterday we took a little while just with a cursory overview of the development, the history of the Old Testament text, and uh, textual criticism in the Old Testament in many ways is a completely different uh, ball game than we have in the New Testament given the nature of the evidence. Uh, because of the work of the Masoretes and the Jewish tradition of destroying reverentially uh, frayed and used uh, documents, scrolls, uh, there is not a lot of extant evidence uh, of actual Hebrew manuscripts leading up to the time of the Masoretes, uh, why the Qumran material was so remarkably uh, important and one of the great uh, contributions then or conclusions that we uh, have from the Qumran material uh, is that it does demonstrate that between that period of 150 BC uh, and the time that we now have our Masoretic uh, manuscripts that the text was indeed being preserved. The similarities uh, indeed are remarkable. There can be some differences in terms of orthography. Qumran uh, tended to use uh, vowel letters uh, more frequently than we have in the text, but that's just a matter of spelling. Uh, it's a matter of spelling, a uh, matter of incorporating or reflecting the vocalization. And once we have the Masoretes coming on and incorporating that system of dots and dashes into those consonants, uh, then the prevalent use of the vowel letters was no longer as necessary. Uh, simply a matter of uh, I, I say orthography and how those uh, words are represented, but the text itself uh, remarkably the same. The versional evidence in the Old Testament uh, becomes therefore of greater significance if we're analyzing and comparing the text, uh, Septuagint particularly being the predominant, uh, the predominant uh, version, uh, the primary version, uh, we come to the Vulgate, and the Vulgate itself expresses and evidences some dependence upon the Septuagint, so not always an independent witness. So I'm not always surprised when I see the Vulgate agreeing with the Septuagint in places where there may be disagreements with the Masoretic text. It's depending upon that. Same thing uh, for uh, the uh, Peshitta and uh, other of the versions as well. So the Septuagint becomes a primary witness, and how we use that uh, must be judicious, uh, but I have to admit, particularly because of the New Testament, uh, the New Testament use of the Septuagint, uh, not always uh, a literal translation, sometimes a very free translation. We'll talk more about the translation philosophy after we uh, come to uh, the end of our discussion on textual criticism. That's part of the issue that we have to address here as well when we look at the uh, continuing use uh, of the uh, of the King James uh, Version, but we'll do that after the discussion here on textual criticism. Now when we come to the New Testament, uh, the nature of the study is significantly different because the nature of the evidence that we have is considerably different. Uh, we have thousands, all right, there are somewhere, I don't know the exact number here, but you see references between four and five thousand uh, Greek witnesses uh, to the status of the New Testament text. In addition to those actual Greek manuscripts, and I'm relying now upon the fact that you remember how we defined our terms uh, yesterday, uh, when we have these 5,000 or so Greek manuscripts of the actual text of the New Testament, that's a significant and a remarkable uh, part of the documentation and the evidence that is before us. In addition to that, we have the versions. In addition to that, we have then the patristic uh, evidence. So the amount of data, the amount of data that we have for New Testament textual criticism uh, is far more extensive and far more numerically uh, large than what we have uh, for the Old Testament. And the history then of that development uh, becomes a bit different. But by faith, and we come back to the presuppositions uh, that we started with yesterday. Uh, we are concerned here essentially 
in this matter with those two questions. How do I know the Bible's the Word of God? By faith in what the Bible says about itself, what Christ says about the Bible. We believe what the Bible teaches concerning inspiration. All right, so we know by faith, by faith, and that faith is not subjective. Faith is objective. Uh, it is based upon that solid revelation. But it is a matter of faith in that supernatural work of God uh, that moved these men inspired, breathed out, being breathed into, and then breathed out uh, by God the very word that he would have recorded for us. Supernatural. When we come to the issue now of the second question, how do I know we have the Bible? Uh, it's still a matter of faith. All right? Ultimately, it is still a matter of faith. Faith now in the providence of God that according to his wise preservation and his wise government and his wise uh, leading, uh, the words that he inspired, the words that he breathed out, have indeed been preserved. And that leads then to that presupposition that we are working on here, that inspiration demands preservation. It demands preservation not only in terms of the books, there's our whole study of canon that's outside of our scope uh, in this little seminar, uh, but it does reflect our understanding of what books are canonical. Uh, why do I reject Maccabees? Why do I reject uh, Bell and the Dragon and so forth? All right, so those issues. But it also now concerns the individual words. If God breathed out every word, if we believe in the verbal, the plenary inspiration of Scripture, uh, then we also are going to believe in the preservation of those words by faith. All right, by faith, I believe in the providential work of God. Not supernatural, but it's nonetheless a work of God. All right, it's nonetheless a work of God, and just as certain then uh, as any other work or act of God. But that raises the question now. That raises the question, if God has preserved every word that he revealed, uh, the question is, how did he do it? All right, can we observe how that uh, preservation manifested itself in time, and the perhaps even more pressing question uh, is where? Uh, where has it been preserved? Where has it been preserved? And answering that question, answering really those two questions, but particularly the second, uh, brings us to the whole issue of uh, textual criticism. Uh, how do we know where? How do we know where, and can we know where? Uh, God has indeed preserved his word. And that's the purpose, then, of textual criticism, uh, the purpose of lower criticism. Uh, again, we understand that God had revealed uh, that word in what we are calling the autographa, right? All right, there's those original, uh, those original documents handled by the apostles uh, in the writing of the New Testament, in the prophets and whatever in the Old Testament. Uh, we don't have those. All right? We don't have those. Uh, and the copying process began. And there's a sense from a human perspective in which we, uh, once we begin a copying process, there's one sense in which that text is put in jeopardy. All right? It's put in jeopardy because the copying process, the copying process is not uh, a supernatural operation. All right? uh, it is not uh, that holy men of God uh, were being moved now to copy this manuscript or this manuscript or that it was not a supernatural operation. Uh, it was a human function governed, yes, by God, preserved by God, but not in the same sense uh, and in the same way that we have inspiration. We must make that, uh, that distinction. So I say there's a sense in which once the copying process began, once the copying process began, it put that text, uh, it put that text in some degree of jeopardy because uh, changes were going to take place. All right, human fatigue, human error, sometimes intentional, sometimes unintentional. I I'm not saying that there were never any intentional errors uh, or changes that were brought into the text. There were intentional changes. Uh, suggested something about that yesterday, even in the Old Testament. Uh, the work of the Sopharim, those Tekin Sopharim, uh, where they altered things a bit to protect Moses or to protect uh, their understanding of God if they didn't quite understand what the text uh, was saying. Those were intentional 
uh, alterations, intentional changes. And there's no question, as we look at the evidence from this massive amount of New Testament witnesses, uh, that there were some changes there. There were some variants uh, that were most likely intentional. But many were unintentional, all right, just because of the uh, human factor that was uh, involved. A very tedious process, a very tedious process to copy something word for word, tit for tat, uh, between this document and that document. Uh, very possible to skip a line, to skip a word, to repeat uh, what was already there. Uh, not intentionally, not because of any sinister motive. Uh, it just happened. But those create variants. Those create variants. So uh, how do we deal with those? Right? How do we, can we recognize? Can we, re can we, be, can we sift out? All right? Can we sift out those corrupt readings? All right, can we sift out those corrupt readings? And remember again how we're using the word corrupt in this context. I'm not saying corrupt in the sense that it's morally and ethically sinister. And No, it's not. we're simply talking about those places where there are deviations. All right, a corrupt reading in textual criticism is simply where there is a deviation from uh, what the original uh, would have been. Can we identify corrupt readings? Uh, and again, I want to emphasize, I don't want to keep repeating myself here, but uh, I, I've just been in this game long enough to know that much of the misunderstanding and rhetoric uh, that is out there concerning this issue is a confusion of terms, all right? Uh, corrupt manuscript or corrupt text. And, well, there's a sense then, if we understand corrupt, that every manuscript that exists is corrupt, all right? Every manuscript that exists is going to have deviations from the original. Uh, there's no two manuscripts of all of these witnesses, of all of these witnesses. Uh, there, there's no two that in every single detail are exactly the same. Uh, so how do we deal with that? But we're focusing, I say, upon the reading. When we look at the readings, that's going to put things in a whole different perspective. But how do we determine? Textual criticism then becomes the means, becomes the mechanism, becomes the discipline whereby we ascertain through this massive amount of witness what the original was. Can we do that? I submit to you, yes, we can. Uh, we, can make that, uh, we can make that discovery. But the very fact that it's possible, the very fact that it's possible to get from all of this massive amount of data, all right, here's all this massive amount of data that we have here, manuscripts, versional evidence, and uh, the... Uh, patristic evidence, we have all this data. The very fact that we can look at all of this data and make our way back to the original presupposes yeah, that there was an original. All right? It presupposes that there was an original that becomes the archetype uh, that all uh, here is bearing witness uh, to. And we, we understand something uh, about that in, in, in regard to measurement, right? Uh, you know, when I, when I grade student papers, when I grade student papers, uh, official papers using Turabian, you know, you got to have your margins at a certain place and page number at a certain place and uh, all of those details. And typically when I grade a student paper, I will have a cup of coffee somewhere near, a red pen in hand, and a six-inch plastic ruler perched between my lips, all right? And as I read that paper, and I come to look at the margins, I will unperch that little plastic ruler, and I will, mar I will measure, is that in, uh, is that left-hand margin at two inches? Is that right, does it exceed the inch? Is that page number in the right place? Is the title down? And I take that little six-inch ruler, right? I, 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 I have several uh, of them. And I will mark students, and I cross it out and say, you have, you have violated the margin, right? You have violated the margin on the basis of my little six-inch uh, ruler. Now, students always complain, but they come and say, how, how do you know? All right, how do you know that's not what it should? Well, here's my ruler, right? And I look at my ruler. It's a little plastic ruler. Uh, and some of the markings on it itself seem to be a quarter inch thick. Some, you know, it, it's not real precise, all right? But it's a six inch ruler. But how do I know what six inches is? All right, how do I know what six inches is? 
How do I know what a foot is? Uh, I'm told. I've never seen it. I have never in my life seen it. Uh, but I understand that in Washington, Smithsonian or someplace, uh, there is a platinum bar. All right, There's a platinum bar that is the standard linear foot. All right, That's the official linear foot. And it's there. I've never seen it. But every other measurement that we use is based upon that standard. All right? It's based upon a standard that I've never seen, but does exist, that becomes the basis then for every six inch ruler or every foot ruler or every, you see, there's a standard. And the very fact that that exists enables me then to identify violating students in terms of their margins. All right? Even though it may not, be, there is a standard. Well, if I can use that analogy here, here's the standard. All right? Here's, I've never seen this. All right? I have never, ever seen those original documents. But the fact that they existed, the fact that they existed now, is what gives, is what gives the uh, credibility uh, to all of this all of this data and can I look at this then and make now I say we've never seen it there is and, and I, I apologize for this I'm, I'm, I'm gonna make a historical statement typically I try to avoid church history uh, all I can uh, but Tertullian all right Tertullian uh, remember the dates of Tertullian when was Tertullian about 200 about AD 200 uh, Tertullian makes the statement that in the churches that were founded by the apostles, in the churches that were founded by the apostles, you can still see the actual letters that were written by Paul, the actual uh, the autographa, all right? As late as 200, Tertullian is saying if you go to these churches founded by the apostles, those original letters are there. Now, we don't have them, but here's an eyewitness, if you will, that they still exist. And the interesting thing is that we have fragments of New Testament, uh, of the New Testament that are even earlier than Tertullian, you see. Uh, so that platinum bar, if you will, existed, and we have copies of it, even contemporary with what Tertullian is, uh, is testifying. I'm saying it's possible, all right? There is a way. Because there is this archetype, there is that standard, uh, those original documents uh, penned by the apostles uh, that give the foundation then for all of this data. Now we don't have that, but we have all the data. And textual criticism then becomes the means of examining all of that data with a view to identifying what that platinum bar uh, actually was. Is it possible? Yes. Now, saying it's possible, uh, but the question is how? Textual criticism becomes the means, the discipline of examining all of this to get to that. Now, as I said yesterday, and I repeat here again, textual criticism ought to be a welcome discipline. It ought to be a welcome discipline then for those of us that believe in the absolute authority and the absolute inspiration of the Word of God. If I believe in that orthodox view of inspiration as that process and as the consequent product that we talked about yesterday, this ought to be a welcome science. I desperately want to know what those words are. And I say as we look at the evidence there are a little difference here, a little difference there. And uh, people will start to throw out numbers that sound to be very, very discouraged. How can we ever know, you see? And there are going to be some that play. Watch how you play with numbers. All right? Watch how you play with numbers. Uh, because there are going to be some on both sides of the issue. All right? There are going to be some on both sides of this issue. You're going to find some critics uh, that will throw out a bunch of these extreme numbers and say, you see, therefore... We can never know with certainty what this was, you see. And you're going to have some on the other extreme 
that say, yes, there are so many differences in all of this, so therefore I choose blank, all right, receive text or this or that or whatever, uh, to be the, and we ignore all the other evidence. Be careful, all right, the, the numbers go something like this, right? Uh, Nestle, if you know Nestle's little Greek Testament, uh, b based on the uh, genealogical uh, method and whatever, but it, 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 in some of the introductions. Uh, he says there's 150,000 variations. As you look at all this massive witness, all these manuscripts, uh, 4,000 to 5,000 manuscripts of the New Testament, he identifies uh, that there are 150,000 variants that are represented. That boils down to about 300 differences on every page of the New Testament. Wow, you see. If there are that many differences, if there are that many, ver 300 on every page of the New Testament, then, you know, how can we ever have any certainty? How can we ever have any certainty that we can get to that original? I say that sounds to be, well, that's depressing, you see. But when you start looking at it, I say this is where we don't want to just play with numbers. If you start looking at all of those differences, 19 out of every 20 are obvious, copious mistakes. All right, they are some of those variants. Nineteen out of every twenty of those are nothing more than in than, than very clear, very clear, copyist mistakes, spelling issues. All right, spelling issues. How you spell Jerusalem? Do you spell Jerusalem with an alpha or an eta there at the end? Well, there's only one way to spell it. You see. Uh, but when you have a, di that's, that's one of the variants, all right? That's one of the, how you spell, and, and spelling, obvious spelling errors that have crept in uh, are part of that massive number. And, I, I, and, and sometimes detography, it becomes very clear, I say, that 19 out of every 20. So immediately that 150,000 is reduced to 7,500 variants that... Uh, that now we have to deal with. And when I look at those, when I look at those, again, about 19 out of 20 have absolutely no sense bearing upon the sense. A word order change, maybe a word order change, maybe a preposition, ace versus in, which the two things are overlapping in their meaning. But 19 out of 20 have no bearing upon the sense or the meaning of the text. Whether I t take that or that, the implication and the meaning is the same. That reduces it now to only 375 variants that have any bearing upon the sense. Have any bearing upon the sense. And when I look at those, now we're, we're, we're less than one per page. We're less than one per page of any uh, kind of variant that actually would affect the meaning. And of that there's no doctrine, right? There's absolutely no doctrine that stands or falls. That falls on the basis of textual criticism. And we'll see some specific examples of that. So I'm saying watch how you play with the numbers, all right? You, if I just start with the number of variants, yeah, those are variants. There's no question they're variants. But when you look at the nature of those variants, here's where most people don't. They just stop at the numbers, throw those out, say, how can we ever know? Or therefore, the best way to deal with the problem is just to select, all right, I say this is where the, and we ignore all the other evidence. No, don't I do that. All right, as I said, faith is never afraid of evidence. Faith is not afraid of evidence. And I, and I don't put my head on the sand. I don't put my head on the sand saying, no, 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 that's not true. All right? I, I reject that, and we're not going to consider that. We're just going to say, here it is. I, I choose this one, to, this manuscript, or this text, or this whatever. No, let's put it together. Let's not be afraid. All right, let's not be afraid to look at the evidence. You say, and, and you know, this, and I hear some say, well, this, if, 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 the, if the people knew this, you see, 
If the people, it would destroy their faith. See, it would destroy the faith of the people. And so let's make sure that we who, that we keep it secret, all right? Or, or, or that, we just, that we don't tell. That's Romanism, all right? That is Romanism. Call it what you will. Pat yourself on the back for being, but that's Romanism, all right? Faith is not afraid of the evidence. And just telling people that that's of the devil, all right? Just telling people that that's from the pit, uh, that that's an Alexandrian cult, or it's not going to cut it. All right? It's not going to cut it because anybody outside of those that you think you can influence, you know, with your rhetoric, are going to laugh you to scorn. And there's a way to preserve uh, the, the use of the authorized version and the majority text without being laughed to scorn as an idiot, you see. And then to define your idiocy as being, you know, piety. Piety. Don't ignore the evidence. Don't ignore the evidence. And we can teach our people. Are we afraid to teach our people? Now, I'm not going to preach a sermon. I'm not going to preach a sermon on textual criticism. All right? Uh, you know, maybe on inspiration. That's why we got our two Ps there yesterday, right? Product and process. Uh, just in case you want to preach that. Uh, but we can teach our people. All right? Our people aren't idiots. All right? Our people aren't idiots. Uh, we can teach them. I say we are not Roman Catholics. We jump on the Catholics, right, for their tradition. We jump on them for uh, hiding things and telling the people, no, no, you trust, you trust the priest. Right? And you, we, we reject that, and well, we should. But let's not be guilty of it. Let's not be guilty of it. Uh, we ought not. Faith is never afraid of evidence. And we just don't ignore it. So how do, how do, we, how do we do it? How do we do it? And there are there are a lot of little tweaks that come up with various theories, and I, I'm not going to take the opportunity in this little seminar class to deal with all of the specifics and the details. But there are basically two uh, two broad approaches. All right, two broad approaches to analyzing the evidence, both of which have the same objective. All right, both of which have the same objective to get back to that original, to get back to that original. Different methods, some different presuppositions, but the same objective. All right? I cannot look at those who have a, uh, what do I do? I hit that? You see that? I learned that from yesterday. Very good. Uh, I, I, I cannot take from uh, those that don't agree with me on how to get back to that original, you know, I can't be jumping on them and, and accusing them of hating God and not believing in inspiration and not, because it's not true. It is not true. Are there some? Yeah, that would be true. There are some that would hold my view that would equally be uh, uh, liberal, all right? This is not an issue of liberalism versus, because you have good, good orthodox, Bible-believing, God-loving men that have a different approach to the same goal. Now, I think the one is wrong. But understand, please, that anyone that doesn't agree with anything that I believe, I assume to be wrong. All right? So let that be clear to you. You don't agree with me, I think you're wrong, all right? Uh, but unless you're just a milk toast of something, of some sort, uh, you believe I'm wrong in those places, all right? Uh, I believe, I, I don't hold any tenant. There's not one tenant of my theology, there's not one tenant of my textual critical views that I think are wrong. I'd be a fool, right? Would I not be a rare fool if, you know, I said, well, you know, I, I'm right so often, right? I'm right on so many things. Uh, just to show you that I am human, I'll choose this wrong view. Uh, just, just to show my, no, I think I'm right on absolutely everything, right? Now, I have to hold that with humility. I have to realize that not everything that I, it is a litmus test for orthodoxy. 
And I think that's where some get. You know, I'm, I'm the standard for orth. I'm not the standard for orthodoxy. The Bible is. I conf we're confessional. Uh, this is a standard. All right. Uh, but there are going to be different. So I want to put things in perspective here. All right. I, I don't want to condemn those that don't always hold my views here. But I want to argue vehemently and logically and clearly for the views uh, that I hold. So while I say there are various little subsets of this, that, and the other, I, I'm, I'm going to deal basically with the two broad, uh, the two broad approaches, and see if we can at least have some uh, basis for holding to what I think to be the right, uh, the right view. But the goals are the same. The objective is the same. How do we get back? How do we get back to the original? document. Now, we're going to be looking first of all then at what we're going to call the genealogical the genealogical method. Some refer to this as the eclectic method. Well, it's all eclectic, all right? Uh, every view is going to be looking at the evidence and choosing between variants. So I don't like the term eclectic to uh, define this. Some call it the critical uh, method. And using that in somewhat of a pejorative sense, all right? Uh, every text is going to be critical. I'm going to be criticizing. Critical is not always a bad word, right? Not always a bad word. So I, I want to just use this benign uh, description of it here, the genealogical method. And summarize what's involved here, and then we'll make some evaluation uh, of it. Two basic canons, all right, there are two basic canons uh, of interpretation. And really, these two canons, maybe I should, you know, start with those before we come back to the uh, to the genealogical method, because there's a sense in which these two canons are going to apply to uh, apply to both of the uh, of the systems. Uh, when we look at the variants, all right. When we have one one reading that says X and another reading that says Y, how do we make the determination? And there are two rules. When I say canons here, I'm talking about rules, right? Uh, there are two rules of observation uh, that really apply to both. So I got a, a, a bit ahead of myself, perhaps, when introducing the genealogical method at that point. What we call, first of all, when I, when I look at these two, intrinsic probability. What is the intrinsic probability? If I have X, if I have Y intrinsically, is there something that can point me to either X or Y? The intrinsic probability. What did the author, all right, what did the author most likely say? What did the author most likely say? This is concerned then with context. This is concerned with style. This is concerned with internal evidence is very subjective, all right? And we have to admit that looking at these variants from the perspective of intrinsic probability is going to be subjective. Uh, you know, particularly when we start talking about the author's style, what is it that constitutes an author's style? And I say most, uh, you know, most unless you are very, very gifted and uh, very, very experienced in the Greek language, uh, you, you don't know enough, all right? I don't mean to insult you here, uh, but my guess is not a person in front of me uh, is experienced enough to start making determinations on the basis of style. When you read your Greek Testament, right? When you read your Greek Testament, you're slugging through it and looking up every other word, uh, and it takes you six hours to translate three verses, and now you're going to be telling me about the author's style. No, no, it's not going to happen. All right, not going to happen. Uh, you know, I, I've dealt with students long enough. You know, I, I, I personally, just as an example, I, I believe Paul wrote Hebrews. 
All right. I believe Paul wrote Hebrews. And invariably, every time I make that statement, some little guy raises his hand and says, but the style is not Pauline. <laughs> I just tell him to shut up. What do you know about style? All right. You don't know a thing about Greek style. Uh, it takes skill. All right. It takes skill. And it's, it's subjective. But that's nonetheless uh, one, of the, one of the issues uh, to be uh, addressed, the context. You know, if, if I'm reading along about, uh, you know, driving, driving through town in, uh, you know, my truck and seeing all of the traffic and the business and then all of a sudden there's a statement there that says when, when you pick beans, make sure you have a, well, it doesn't quite fit the context, all right? And so that suggests maybe something there is, is askew. But that's intrinsic. Uh, probability. The second transcriptional probability. Transcriptional probability. What did the scribe most likely say or do? All right. What did the scribe most likely say or do? So this is concerned with the various kinds of potential scribal errors, all right? This is why you want to, I'm not going to take time to go through all of those, but know the kind, look at your introduction book, Archer's got a good discussion there and uh, of the different kinds of textual errors, dictography, if something is repeated twice, repeated twice, repeated, uh, nice tautology uh, there, uh, for those of you that know what tautology is. Uh, that was an example of tautology. Uh, I can pretty much tell that, all right? Uh, the hapography and the uh, homoteleton, similar endings, we can figure that out, all right? So I, I want to know what those potential scribal errors uh, were, unintentional, either by the hearing or by the sight, uh, and you can pretty much tell sometimes whether uh, that scri that whether that manuscript was copied uh, tit for tat by looking at it or whether it was done by hearing because of the nature of some of the m mistakes that are there, some by sound, some by, uh, some by sight. So what would the scribe most likely do? Uh, some are uh, in, in intentional. Some are intentional. Uh, unintentional, intentional things. The transcriptional probability, what would the scribe? most likely have done. So these two things, we every textual critic is going to look at and consider to some, this is more subjective, this is a bit more objective, but both of those have some degree of, uh, some degree of objectivity uh, involved uh, with them. Uh, but certainly the genealogical method that uh, we look at here is going to uh, be involved as well. Now other canons that uh, are applied uh, usually to the genealogical method so I guess we can go ahead and come back to to that yeah come back to our genealogical uh, method the well, let me list these first then I'm trying to think how I want to handle this principles for determining all right, this, this is the question now. I have reading X, reading X, not manuscript X. I have reading, what's a reading? I have my document and I come now to a place in that document, right, uh, where there is a difference. All right, that's a variant reading. So I have one that says X and I have one that says Y. I can see the difference, but now the question is how do I know which is superior, all right? I, the text for critic is trying to determine now which of these readings is superior. Is X superior? Is Y superior? How do we know? All right, here are some of the principles uh, used here, uh, particularly in the genealogical method, uh, for making the determination as to whether X or Y. First of all, the older reading is preserved. The older reading is preserved, or is preferred, I should say. The older reading is preferred. Now, on the one hand, I've got no problem with that. In fact, I don't want the older reading. I want the oldest, 
right? I'm looking for the oldest reading. Uh, so I think we all would agree, yeah, that we're looking for the older reading and indeed the oldest reading. But here's where the principle, I think the principle, one of the principle uh, mistakes occur. That very often in this, in, in this uh, practice, the older reading is equated with the older manuscript. All right, that is a fundamental error, a fundamental error of logic, a fundamental error of logic. Those that hold this view would not put it in those terms, but I'm saying in practice that's exactly what happens. The older reading is preferred, but in essence, in implementation, that is applied to the oldest manuscript. So I have now, here's manuscript A, and I don't mean by that Alexandria at this time, right? I'm just using A. Here's manuscript A, and let's say we can date manuscript A on the basis of paleography, on the basis of, and we can do that, right? We can do that if you know the history of, uh, of, of writing in Greek, the earlier forms were in unseals. What do you mean by unseals? All capitals. All capitals. All right, all capital letters, no word divisions, all right, no word divisions. Uh, we would find that very awkward, all right? We would find that very awkward because in English, uh, we don't have terminative endings and so forth, right? So if I have this expression, what does this say? What does that say? No. Depends on your take, right? God is nowhere, all right? Or God is now here. I can't horse around like that in English, all right? I can't horse, because your presupposition is going to tell you what, you know, that, that says. But in Greek, because some of us, anyway, know how Greek words end, all right? Whether they are nouns or verbs, uh, and so... There are no word divisions. And you look at some of these early unsealed manuscripts. They're beautiful. All right? You talk about, uh, you, you talk about justified margins. All right? You know, uh, they, they, they were perfect. All right? And, and you'll, have, you'll have the text in, in, in various columns on, on a page. And when they got to the end of the line, when they got to the end, if there was one letter left, they just put it down on the next line. All right? Uh, didn't care about putting the words... Uh, even together. No hyphens, anything like that. When they got to the end of the line, they just scooted down to the next line. You look at it, they're beautiful. All right? They're beautiful. Uh, but all capitals. And, and, and then uh, it, it moved from the unseals to the minuscules, all right? the more of a cursive type of uh, writing. Um, now some spaces between. So that's paleography, the, the writing, the orthography. Now, so let's say I have, I have manuscript A, which on the basis of the, uh, the document, the, what is it parchment, is it papyrus, you can, you know, date some things there. Let, let's say we can date this thing to, we date that to the 5th century A.D. And now I have another manuscript over here, B, and on the basis of, now, now it's a minuscule, all right, now it's a minuscule, uh, mm -hmm. cursive, uh, and we, we date that to the, uh, let's say we date that to the 11th century, 80, all right? And so when I compare now, I, I'm, I'm comparing now manuscript, and, and do I not want to compare those, you see? This, this, is, this is what brought this whole thing together, right? In, in the, uh, for, for years, this was not an issue. Textual criticism really was not an issue for many, many years, certainly in the time of the AV translators, not an issue. Uh, here's here's our edition. We're using the edition, but now with stuff happening in archaeology, right? Uh, here here's a all, all, here's all this all these Greek documents now, here are all these Greek manuscripts that are, are are being discovered, coming to light, and you see, woo, that's Mark, ooh, that's Romans, ooh, that's what would you if if you'd been living back in the 
19th century, and some of these things now start to come to light, what would you say? Oh, don't show those to me! Throw those away! No, this is God's Word. Look, it's all. Let's look at it. Let's look at it, and we want to read it, and we look. And you start to say, wait a minute, there's some differences here. All right, there's some differences here. And some of these views in the text were criticism, then evolved out of this massive amount of evidence that is now coming to light through archaeology and whatever, all these Greek manuscripts. What do we do with these? We start making the, we start making the comparisons. How do, we, how do we do it now? All right, so here's a manuscript, 5th century manuscript, 11th century. And I come comparing this, and sure enough, that one says X, and that says Y, what to do, what to do. Older reading is preserved. Well, wait a minute. This is 5th, that's 11th. The older, does it not make sense that the older reading is to be in the older manuscript? That's the assumption. Would not be stated that way, but in practice that very often is what happens. And I submit to you that is an illegitimate conclusion. It's an illogical conclusion. If we're looking at the reading and not the manuscript, why I must make that difference between reading and manuscript. If I look at the reading, it very well may be, and many times it will be, that the older reading is actually in the latest manuscript. All right? It very well may be that the older reading is preserved and recorded in the later of the manuscripts. That, to me, is one of the outstanding fallacies of logic that is so often used uh, with the genealogical method. But that's the idea, all right? The older reading is to be preferred. Second uh, thing here is the briefer reading is preferred. The briefer of the, if I have reading X and reading Y, and this one is shorter than that one, this rule of thumb, this canon says that X, the shorter reading, is preferred over the longer because now on the basis of transcriptional probability, the assumption is the scribe would most likely leave something out than add something, all right? Because adding something, right, adding something uh, would, uh, for explanation or whatever, would be more likely a scribal activity. He would be careful not to leave anything out. All right, the scribe would not leave anything out, but he might indeed add something. So that's an assumption based upon transcriptional probability. Third, uh, the harder reading is to be preferred. The harder reading is preferred. Uh, with the assumption here on the basis, again, of transcriptional probability, that the scribe would most likely simplify something rather than complicate it. Uh, grammatically or theologically or whatever. Uh, and they would tend here even to come to the place when there is a, between the manuscript, what would be a grammatical error. They'll give the credibility very often to the scribe who corrected that grammatical error and see that the original would have been the harder reading, right? giving more credibility sometimes to the scribe than the original author. Fourth, uh, the reading that best suits the context. Here's the intrinsic probability. The reading that best suits the context is preferred. Well, certainly I want to be sensitive to the context, all right, but how far do we go with that? And then number five, the reading that best explains the others, all right? Can, can, we, look at, uh, can we look at this and make the assessment which reading best explains the others, all right? So if I have one manuscript that says uh, Christ was full of truth. Christ was full of truth. I have another manuscript that says Christ was full of grace. 
And I have another manuscript that says Christ was full of grace, grace and truth, truth and grace, whatever. Which of these best explains the others? Right? The notion is that a conflated reading, probably, here's a scribe that had saw that, he saw that what to do, what to do, I'll put them both, all right? I'll put them both. So that one would be immediately jettisoned. Now we have to determine between those two, all right? So those readings explain that one. So if that can be explained on the basis, then that's the notion here, that the reading that best explains the others would be preferred. And in many, as you go through here, many of these cancel themselves out, all right? They're, they're, they're contradictory. Uh, not always, you know, it may be, it, it may be the, older manuscript that says this, but actually it's the fuller reading, or maybe, you see. And you have these ideas that could possibly be um, self-contradictory. Okay, well, we'll got to stop here, uh, and we'll come back and then look specifically at the genealogical method.